Hey there, uh, here is another video going through uh, yet another test. Uh, and this is the uh, my class's second uh, test on this. Uh, I believe that you can never really do enough tests. Uh, it's always great to do more. The aim, or at least when I was a student, the aim was just to focus on trying to get a perfect score. And I know it's crazy. Sounds sounds like a big uh, ask, but really, uh, as I say many times, there's only a certain number of concepts. You just gotta learn them all. And when it comes down to it, it's just a list. And if you can tick off all the things on that list, then you got it. So at least we aim for the best and we see how we go. So this test has 18 multiple choice questions and it has one free response question, which is worth 12 points. And I'll talk quickly through what each thing is worth and what the what we're looking for with the points. Now, these are not exam questions, not quite the exam level questions, like uh, exam, exam questions are uh, proprietary, I guess. And so I can't use them on a video like this, uh, but I did choose questions that are uh, summative mostly which means that they're mostly testing your knowledge of the concepts in a test formation, uh, not, not the formative questions, which are generally for just sort of beginning knowledge. This is to see if you really know the stuff. Okay, so as I go through these questions, uh, I'm gonna do it through the, the College Board site, but I'm also going to switch around and go between my different slides that I've got and I've got a few different slides on these topics. And so I can refer to those as we go. All right, and I've also got a little window here I'll pop open just to write some Java if I need to. Okay, now this is not gonna be in depth, but feel free to pause, go back and, and uh, check again. All right, so let's hit question one. Okay, let's take a quick look at this definition. We have a class element. Okay, here's what you notice first. Static. Static. What is a static? Well, a static is a variable that belongs to the class, not the object. And I think I talked about this here in uh, these. Let's see. This was 5.7. Let's go through and see if I can get to 5.7 quickly. Okay, it's always good to kind of look at the the theory. Yeah, we go. Right. All right. So if you see a static variable, when you when you have a class, a class is defining uh, what what it's like a blueprint, right, for these different objects. And normally, when we make a variable, we will have, for example, when we make an x variable, it'll be a, a copy of it in each object. Each object will have its own copy, but static variables exist in the class. So actually all the objects share this static variable. So they can all see it and they can all change it. Okay. So unless it's a final, if it's a final, then they can't change it anymore. It's already set, but statics uh, belong to the class. So remember if there's one version of them and that's the key. All right. So normally this is an example of a final it means that once it's set, it's done. It's like setting concrete. That's final. But the static part means that every every object that's made from this class is going to share this this uh, variable here. Okay. So we just put static in there. Okay. So let's let's take a look at the question here, guys. So. We have a max value, which is set to zero at the start. Then we have value, and here's a constructor. How do we know it's a constructor? Well, it has the same name as the class. It takes an input, an integer. Okay, so value equals v. Okay, so it's, it's taking this input and it's putting it into here. If the value is greater than the max value, then max value equals value. So what it's doing here is saying, let's update the static max value variable, right? Remember the class is holding this 
and it's there's only one so if there's one element that's made with a value that's the biggest it will update that value and it keeps track of which object has the maximum value mm -hmm. so let's see there's a code segment that appears in another class than element for okay so it's a loop of five and it says we're making a random number and we're multiplying by 10. So let's talk a little bit about randoms. Now this is going back a little bit, but just in case you're not familiar, let's remember random generates a, a, a number, okay, which is a double and it's between zero, well it's greater than zero, but it's zero to 0 0.99999, right? And so it's in the middle, in somewhere in there, right? So you have to remember that as a double, if you want to get it to a whole number, you'd have to multiply that by 10. Now, let's say the number was 0 0.009, for example. Multiply that by 10, it's still going to be close to 0, right? It's going to round down to 0. So if you want to get a number between 1 and 10, you're going to need to add 1. Okay, because if, if it was like 0 0.9999999 and then you multiply by 10, you would have 9.9999999 and that 9.9999 would get dropped off when you convert it back to int. Because int doesn't round, it just drops off the back. So this is basically generating a number between 1 and 10. So I want you to... Practice, you should be practiced enough now because okay, so here here's where the exam time makes a difference, right? In an exam like this You're mostly going to run out of time and that's the fact of the matter is that Time is not your friend. You got to get through this as fast as you can. So if you have to start thinking about random numbers In the exam, that's time If you can see this code and be like, oh, yeah, it's a random number between 1 and 10 you just saved yourself a bunch of time. So the whole course is like this. If you can recognize these chunks, if you can start chunking your information and stop looking at it like just little bits of words and little codes and start to chunk it like this means this, then you're gonna have a much better time and you do it much faster. Okay, so number between one and 10. Calculate that, convert it to an int, great. Okay, so k is a random number. If k is greater than the max value, then we make a new element with k. All right? So, you're doing this in a loop. Now, are we guaranteed that we're gonna be greater than the max? Not really. Uh, maybe we will be one the first time, two the second time, three the third time etc. Maybe. Um, but it's possible that no elements will be created. All right, so keep that in mind. But we do know that when we start, the max value is zero. Right? Max value is zero at the start. So we're definitely going to create one because this is a random number between one and ten. So guarantee first one definitely bigger than zero. So we create one. Are we guaranteed to create another one? Well, have a think about it. If we create one, let's say the first one we create is is uh, ten. It'll be hard to create a bigger number because it's between one and ten. But this also says greater than or equal to element dot max value so we could create another one right I mean in theory we could create another one it's possible so I wouldn't put it out of the range of possibility um, so let's see that means that exactly five element objects are created or no because it could be less than and therefore it wouldn't get created so there's an if here, which is limiting how many times it's going to get created. So 
Definitely not that one. Definitely not that one. Between 0 and 5, we'll know the 0. We just counted that already. Between 1 and 5 are created, an element max value is increased for every object created. Is it though? Are we guaranteed that it's going to be increased for every object? No, because we're randomly generating numbers here. It might, like it might increase, but what if it's equal to, right? So you're saying that, yes, if if it's this, like, so it has to be greater than or equal to. And that means that we could get an equal number. And if it's an equal number, we wouldn't be increasing the max value. We're only increasing max value if it's greater than. So there's a chance we get a max value is five and we get another five and we generate one, but we don't increase, right? But we do know that at least one object will be increased. So our answer here is E. Okay, that's the answer because uh, of that. So I know it took a, a while to talk about that, but uh, the important thing, I mean, 10 minutes for this question would be too long in an exam. However, I just wanted to talk through it and just show you some of the concepts. I will go faster as we go. Here we have a, a method called changein, which takes as input a list of integers or an, an array of integers and a number. And what does it do? It says, okay, let's take this list and let's say make a new list and then go through here, set num to zero, and go through here and set every value in list to zero. So that's the purpose of this method. Basically, it seems to be trying to change this list and this num to zeros. Then we have a, a start method. Well, when it runs start, it's going to make this little array. And the number six, it's going to put that through change it. And then it's going to print out this with a space. And your job is to find out, oh, which thing does it print? Or does it print anything at all? So you might be tempted to choose this one. But if you chose this one, the obvious one, it would be wrong. It's not this one. Okay. So despite what you think, it's not actually going to change it. Why? Okay. So let's, this kind of has to do with, um, one of the things that we studied here, which is, let me go back here and try and find the thing that I'm looking for, which is that, oh, there we go. Uh, objects and arrays are references, okay? They are like links. So you have to remember that links to objects are not objects. So they are just connections to objects, right? And when, we, when we're doing this, we're basically saying that a link to an object, don't get it confused with the object. Now, in our question, when we are, are getting this as an input, we're taking a list as an input, this is actually just a copy of the reference. So it's a version of the reference. So it's it's like you make a shortcut to something. You just make a copy of that shortcut and give it to the thing. So technically, it's still pointing at this point here. It's still pointing to that place in memory that holds the list, right? So if you imagine here, this is this is being held in memory somewhere, and this uh, link that it's being sent to change it. It's made a copy of this link, nums, and it's now it comes input here. So it's still technically pointing to this memory space. However, what happens when we run this, change it, now generates a new memory space, which is a new set of these, right? So now it's no longer pointing down here. This copy of the nums point reference is now pointing to another array and it's now called list here right 
So it's assigned to list. So now list is basically pointing to this other space. And that means that this will be untouched. Now, uh, num, well, look, when we pass an, a, a, a primitive type into a function, we're passing the value. We're not passing the actual thing. So it's just the value that we're updating here. So this is being sent as a value, num3. It won't have any relationship to this. This will keep its value. So you can't go and change a variable through a function like that. So this is passed by value. This is passed by a copy of the reference, which is now pointing to a different memory space. If it was pointing to the same memory space, then we might be able to update it. But as it's pointing to a now a different memory space, a new memory space, this won't have any effect. Right? The new memory space is going to get set to zero, doesn't matter. So when we come down to here to print it out, we end up we'll end up with the same thing. We'll end up with one, two, three, four, five, and then six at the end. And so that would be the answer. Let's go and check that and make sure I'm right. Okay. So it's a it, it's one of the more complicated concepts in in this language is to understand the difference between a primitive type and a reference and how a reference is passed to other functions. All right. Question three. Let's let's keep moving. All right. So question three. Let's see. We have mm. another example of a. Uh, an array and a number. Okay, so let's see. Let's keep this in mind. So we have uh, v equals zero, k equals zero. Well, k is less than array length, and array k less than lim. So the value that we're going through is less than lim. Okay. Okay. So if array k is greater than v. V equals array k. Mm -hmm. All right. So, can you kind of get a feel for what's happening here? This is actually looking on this. This part here is saying that v is kind of keeping track of the largest number, right? And as we go through, this is also uh, going through, and it's making sure that nothing, we don't find a value bigger than this one. So the values have to be less than this, and we're keeping track of the biggest one as we go through. <clears throat> and then we get k plus plus to increase, right? All right, so assume that do sum is called and executes without error, which of the following are possible combinations for the value of lim, the number of times statement s is executed, and the number of times statement t is executed. Okay, so are we always gonna find a value which is bigger than this. Um, it's not always guaranteed. We don't know what's in the list. Okay. Precondition array only contains positive values. So um, yes, we're going to find one, at least one. So this will run at least once. And this will run every time after this, right? So here is the value of lib. Execution of statement S and statement T. All right, so um, unfortunately we are, we don't have any for other than that. Okay, so the only way we can, we can really track this is if we assume that this is true, right? So Value of limb, five, seven, three. Let's track it and see. If we get five here, so we assume that limb is five, we must assume that we have uh, started at zero, right? We started at zero, so this must have been executed at least once if we found a value and It would have exited uh, when we hit five. So at least once, 
this, it's unlikely that that would be zero, right? We would have at least executed it once. So I would say that this zero is kind of telling you that it's unlikely because because we're starting at zero, we must at least find one value. So I would say that disqualifies number one. 749. Okay, so 749. So if this was seven, we don't know what's in the array. Okay, but is is it possible that, I mean, this K would definitely have to be a bigger number than this. It's not guaranteed that we're going to find a value bigger than, than V every single time, right? We're not always going to find the bigger number. We might, but it's unlikely. But anyway, the the thing is that K is always going to be bigger than, than so statement T is always going to run more times than statement S. So in this case, this doesn't make sense either. Running five times statement S and running twice statement T, mm -mm, doesn't seem right. And so I would say that two is the only one that really makes sense, okay, based on what we have. And let's see if I'm right. It did take me a little while there. It was a tricky one, but at first you get stumped because you don't see the knowledge, but uh, you don't have the, the array, you don't have some of the information, but it's basically saying that if you know that uh, this has to execute only sometimes, and this will execute every time, then you can see that this, this, uh, this couldn't possibly work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, here we have a similar question, right? We have um, a question where we're taking a string and an int. And again, we're passing this by reference. So this is a reference and it's a copy. So it's a copy of a reference, right? So as we have uh, this here in string, the string world, right? This is pointing, basically this S, is pointing to some place in memory that has world, right? And then we make a copy of it and give it to changer, which supposedly is going to take a copy of that pointer, which also is like pointing now to this world in memory. Now, when changer takes it, it takes that pointer and it says, okay, this pointer is now going to point to world plus piece, which joins together to be world piece. Now that's a different word, right? And X is going to be pointing to that world piece, not to world. So Java sort of handles these things as separate things. World is still there in memory somewhere, but world piece is in another place. It's a different place in memory. And so because there's a copy, a copy of this reference, this reference is pointing to world piece and this reference is still pointing to world. So here nothing has really changed, right? It's changed for X up here, but it hasn't changed for this pointer. And so therefore when we are at, when it's asking us here in this question, what is the right answer? It's not this one, it's world and six. Because six isn't changed either, because six is passed as an integer is passed as by value. The value is passed, not the variable, right? So it's just a value passed up there and it's not changed. This not doesn't affect what this is. Okay. So this is a, a pretty tricky concept, but we're covering a couple of questions on it now, so hopefully that's more solidified in your mind that this is these are pointers to memory places and that strings are immutable meaning they can't be changed when you change a string it's now a different kind of memory space and the pointer is going to be pointing to that memory space instead okay so we have that one all right question five Okay, here we have class worker. Um, this, uh, we have a method called get earnings, 
right? So here we have a bunch of doubles, private double, private double, hourly rate, hours worked, earnings. We have a constructor and updates those. Calculate earnings, okay, double earnings zero, plus equals hourly rate times hours worked. Okay, all good so far. And get earnings equals calculate earnings, return earnings. Okay, returns to double. Okay, so then let's see. We have a code segment in another, another class. And it says, okay, Bob's a new worker with 2040. What is it again? 2040, rates and hours. Okay, rate and hours. So it is rate and hours. Okay, so 20 times 40. What, which of the filling displays why an incorrect value is printed? So why do we have an incorrect value? And here, what are we using? We have worker, new worker, Bob. Assistant map print ln Bob dot earnings. Now, Bob dot get earnings. Public double, yes. Correct. Yes, seems correct. Calculate earnings. Correct. Constructor, double, double. Okay, so what is the issue? Can we find the issue? Okay, so let's see here. We do have, let's check here, private double, okay, private double earnings, double rate, double earnings, okay. Ah, well, it's now declaring, what's this? Double earnings equals zero, zero. So what's happened here is that we have a value which is uh, set, right? This has now become a local variable here. So this, it's, it's being declared again. So this has now become a local variable to this function here, double earnings. So this local variable means that earnings is zero, zero, and now earnings here is going to be referring to this one, not this one. And it's very specific that when, when you create a local variable in a function, in a method, that local variable will be used. If you use the name of this, it'll be using referring to this one. If you want to refer to, to the, the one in the class, the instance variable, you'd have to use this begin in this to talk about this dot earnings right if it has the same name so this won't even amount to anything because it's going to save in here once that once that's finished this method's finished it will just close and so when it returns earnings that'll be this in this function this earnings will be referring to this one so it'll return zero because it never gets updated so let's see which one that is Okay, I think it's D. So we try D. Lock it in, D. Okay, so scope of your variables is very important. This where, how your variables apply is important. Okay. All right, let's go to the next one. Six. All right, question six. Um, this question says we have an integer values, okay, 10, size 10, and we're going to interchange the one at 0 and the one at 5. So, how do we do it? Um, clearly, I think this, <laughs> this is wrong. We're trying to swap them. Uh, 5 and 0 don't play into it, so no. This is the value five. We're looking for the thing at index zero and the thing at index five to swap. If you if you know by now, you need a, an intermediate value here in order to swap things. And so hopefully you can understand now that we need to have this kind of format. Uh, just make sure that it's, it's in the right order. So we have two which are the same, right? This and this, so let's see. That one isn't in the right format. These two, are, these two are the typical swapping code. So let's see. Save the one at five in K. Save the one at five in zero. 
Okay, so we haven't saved zero in this case. Zero gets overridden and it hasn't been saved anywhere, so it's not that one. Save the one at zero into K. Right, so now this is saved. Update zero with the one at five and then take the one in K and put it into five. So, yep, yeah, it's D. Great. Next one. Seven. Okay, uh, here we have a static, a static method, get value. Static means that, in, in terms of a method, it means that it belongs to the class, and you don't need to have an object to run it. Okay, so here we're going to be returning an int. We're taking an array of ints, and we're taking two integers. Let's see. And this says return data j plus data k. So return the sum of the things that are at this index and this index in this array. All right. Okay, so what's going to print 70? All right, so this is a matter of like finding the ones that equal 70, adding them together. So this is 0 and 1, make it 70. And that's 1 and 2, so no. Um, we're trying to make 70, so this one and this one. And no, this is 1 and 2. Uh, 70, how do I make 70 here? Either this one and this one, or this one and this one. As you see here, we've got this, right? 1 and 2, 1 and 2, make 70. So I think we're good with C, I think, this one. Um, I don't think we need to go any further. I think we found the value. When you find it, Stop. All right, very good. Okay, so here we are at number eight. We have a method uh, static void add one to everything. Okay, so static here means it belongs to the class. You don't need to uh, create an object to make this one. But as this is just coming to us as a method, I don't think it matters. Uh, not returning anything, it's taking an integer array called numbers. It goes through that array, and for each value, it increases it by one. So it goes through the whole array and increases each number by one. This question is asking, which of the following segments, if any, can be used to replace the body of the method so that numbers will contain the same value? So What's an equivalent statement for this? We have an enhanced for loop where we take uh, the array here on the side and it will give us each value and it will call each value num and then it adds one to num. Looks good. Uh, this one, this has uh, enhanced for loop, but square brackets doesn't go together. Uh, square brackets are the indexes, and j, is, well, there's no j here anyway. So, and here, um, num is the value in there, and we're trying to use the value as an index. That's, that's really weird. But what really we need to get a closer look at is this one. Now, it looks the same, it looks like it does the same thing, but the important thing to note is here that, you know, we don't actually get the value that's in the array. We're actually getting a copy of the value when we use an enhanced for loop. So if you're trying to update these values, it's not gonna work. These are just kind of um, copies of the, of, the num, uh, of the numbers in the array. So we're not actually getting uh, the original uh, for an enhanced for loop. And therefore, it's not suitable to be replacing this one because this one is actually updating the numbers. So that's the key. With enhanced for loops, be careful. They're convenient, but they're not as good as the other ones because they don't do all the things that they do. So uh, we would say none of them, not one, two, or three, is the equivalent one for that one. Alrighty, 
Number nine. Okay, so we have all even, uh, and it's intended to return true if all elements are even numbers. Otherwise, it's going to return false. So let's see. We go through the array, check if they're all even, return true. Okay, so we have boolean is even equals, and we have an expression. Okay, something is there. Then we have a for loop going through the whole array with some loop body. And then we return is even, is boolean. Okay, so here's the question. What can we replace this with? Uh, so we're going to replace this and this. Well, usually when we see this kind of pattern, the pattern is we start it with false because we haven't found it yet. And we go through the, the thing and we try and find it. And if we find it, we say, hey, it's true. Is even equals true. So if, there's an if statement in here, if. Now, what's the code for an even number? Well, you should know this by now. We have uh, the modulus, right? We take the modulus two, so mod two. If the value mod two equals equals zero, then that means it's an even number. There's no remainder when you divide by two. So therefore, that would be true. So A, that works. Is this an A, B, C, or D thing? Okay, I think we're right. I think we're pretty good. Uh, we don't even need to worry about the other ones. I think, uh, I think this is just A. So I could explain why it's not the other ones. Shall I do that? Oh, I might. Oh, jeez, I'm, I'm wrong. Oh, jeez, what's, what's wrong with my thing? If array k equals true, I might. for is even if all elements oh. Oh, so here's me jumping ahead too far okay so read the question carefully if all elements in array array are even not just if one of them so this one solves it if you find one that's even, then we flip the even, and then we're happy we found one. But I, I read too quickly. If all elements are even, okay. So, if all elements are even. All right. So in that case, we need to start from the assumption that the opposite that is true. So we start with the true, and we look for anything that's not even. And if we find it, we flip it to false. So that's the better way to do it. Start with true. If we find something that's not even, flip it to false. And that's the answer. Sorry about that. Read too fast. Okay, question 10. Okay, so we have instance variable nums, which is an array, uh, array of integers, and Find longest with line numbers out of a reference. Okay, method find longest is intended to find the longest consecutive block of a value target occurring in the array, nums. So, lo longest consecutive block of the value target. So, if we're looking for target 10, we're trying to find, we've got 10, 10, 10, that's the longest block, so it should be 3. Right? So, we're looking for, the, not that we've got 15 here, but we're looking for 10. Uh, so, let's see if we can check this out and see if it works. Uh, len count, max len. Let's just see what it's asking for. Doesn't work as intended. Okay, good. So we'll look for some errors. Um, and we have to try and find the value returned by a call. Okay, so what's going to happen to the value? Okay. Right, so we start with both at zero, and we go through all of the nums. And we say if the val equals target, we then count plus plus. Okay, good so far. Search for that. Else, so we don't find, so if this isn't our target, then we have an if. If len count 
is greater than max len, max len equals len count. So it's saying that, okay, if we, we finish the run, like as we're doing this, we are checking the run of like how many we find in a row, right? So if it's like 10 and 10 and 10, it's going to count three. But then we get to the next one, so it's 15, then it's going to be like, okay, do this one. And it's going to update the max len if it's bigger. Okay, pretty good so far. However, we go through the whole array like this. What's happening to len count? Len count, if you notice, it's getting updated. It's not getting reset. In here, we should be resetting the len count. Because if we get to another letter array, we're now no longer in a run. This algorithm is going to actually count all of the, the values, not the run of values, not the block. Okay, at the end, if len count creates max len, we do this again. Okay, so uh, return max len. So this is basically going to be finding the complete number, uh, number of occurrences instead of the actual len. So, right. It's finding the number of occurrences because it doesn't reset the counter. Okay, and what's this here? Okay, good. We've got the same question. Continuation. What's the next question? Which of the following changes should be made so that method find longest will work? All right, good. So we've got to insert len count equals zero. Where do we want to put it? Well, I would put it uh, len count. Okay, so after we've updated the max len, then we're going to put len count here after. So I would say between lines 12 and 13. That would be E. Right, reset it, and then that would work. All right, question 12. Okay, so we have an incomplete method here. Okay, so uh, this one intended to return the longest string in the string array words. So we have an, a, a, an array of strings called words. We're going to return a string. It's going to return the longest string. Assume that the array contains at least one element. All right, so we're missing something here. And it says for int k equals one. So we're starting at one. k less than words length. K plus plus, okay. If words k dot length is greater than longest dot length, longest equals words k. Okay. So it's saving this longest uh, word, right? So why do you think it started at one? Well, what happened to zero? I'm guessing that probably we set the first longest one to be zero in the beginning. So longest is keeping track of the longest word, right? So we usually set that to, to the first object because, hey, we're starting up. Let's just set the first one to be longest and then start checking from the second one and see if the second one's bigger than longest. So my definition would probably go something like this. Uh, let's see, string longest equals words zero. So we're setting the longest string that we've seen to be the first value. Which of the following is the reason to use an array list instead of an array? All right, so, well, we've got a number of benefits. I'll bring them up here. Got some benefits to array list. So, well, you can't resize arrays. Uh, you have to keep writing these common functions, which are kind of annoying. You have to keep doing them. Um, complicated to reorder and move. Not dynamic or flexible, so not that versatile, right? 
So these are the comparisons. Let's see if any of these help us out. Faster access. Don't know if that was a benefit. Less memory? Hmm, not sure about that. Store objects and an array can only store primitive types. Mm, no. I think we can store strings, right? Um, array list resizes itself as necessary when items are added, but an array does not. Oh, now that looks pretty good. Okay, so uh, this one. We found our answer. It's it's clearly it's gonna be D. I think that's like just the uh, pretty easy question there, D. Okay. Fourteen. Okay. So now we're getting to some array list questions. And array lists pretty interesting things. There's only a few methods you have to remember, but you have to know how they work. Um, when we add, we're adding things. When we're setting things, what are we doing? And so this is just testing, do you know how to use these methods? Uh, please check the Java Quick Reference in the exam. You have access to that. Okay, so let's see. We have an, a new array list of animals. We add fox. We add squirrel, but we add it at position zero. So what happens to fox? It gets moved along. Squirrel is now first, fox is now second. Then we add deer. Deer gets added to the end. So we have squirrel, fox, deer. Then we set two to be groundhog. So where we had squirrel and fox and deer, deer has been replaced now with groundhog. So it's now squirrel, fox, groundhog. Then we add mouse at position one. So we have squirrel, mouse, fox, groundhog. And then we say, um, get to and get three. Right. So we're basically trying to, uh, 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 so, so now it's squirrel, mouse, fox, groundhog. So we're looking at fox and groundhog, right? Um, all right. No. Uh, I got confused again. Hang on, wait. So fox, squirrel, fox, deer. Right? Squirrel, fox, groundhog. Squirrel, fox, right, squirrel, mouse, fox, groundhog. So it's fox and groundhog, right? Yeah, fox and groundhog. Yeah, fox and groundhog. Okay. B. Jeez. It would help if I had a pen and paper. I get confused. Um, okay, so you could. Fox and Groundhog. It's just knowing the difference between setting and adding. Okay. All right. Now, mm, I'll show you. Hey, I've got a little thing here. I could have done my array there. Silly me. Okay. Next, maybe I'll remember that for next time. Okay. So we have a code to me. We have an old list. Okay. Or it's just a list called old list. New array list. Okay, so we add 100, we add 200, we add 300, we add 400. Okay, great, so I'm gonna make a little list here. So we should end up with our list, our array list is gonna be 100, 200, oops, 200, 300, 400. Okay, now we have a new list. Okay, great, so this is old list. And now we go new list. So we say now new list, it says add old list remove one. So when you use remove, you take the thing away from position one and it returns that so that you can then use it. So this becomes 
whatever was here so it's popped off so we remove from 200 200 there and 200 will get added to new list here now we say old list dot get to so we get the value at 2 0 1 2 that's 400 and we add it to new list so 400 we don't remove it from the other one it stays there and we print new list okay so we should get Give myself a heart attack. Okay, it's there. Yep. All right, next question. Okay, so we got the data field and method. We got an array list list. Now, if you notice here, array list doesn't hasn't been given a type. All right, it's just a default list. Okay, so we have mystery. Takes integer. Okay, here we go. We go from zero up to n. And then we say list dot remove zero. So we're removing whatever the start of the list, and then we're adding it to the end. So we're just saving whatever was at the start of the list in here, and then we're adding it to the end of the list. And we're doing that n times, right? So we're taking n values from the start of the list and adding them to the end so let's see mystery three we have this array here so we're taking three these three from the start and adding them to the end so we're looking for something that starts with eight and then eight four three six eleven one twelve nine seven so I would say it's D. All right, almost there. 17. Okay, so we have a method. Removes all occurrences of name to remove from name list. Okay. So when we're removing, we should kind of remember we don't want to use enhanced for loops. So when you remove from a list, the trouble is, and I've discussed this in other videos, but if you're removing stuff from a list, it's bad news to uh, be be taking because the enhanced for loop uh, it doesn't work when you remove things. It's trying to go through every item, and if you start removing them in the middle. It's going to get upset so that won't work this one also won't really like it because you're going forwards and you remove something and now the indexes are messed up you've skipped over another index right so um I, 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 yeah we generally what we do this is the better pattern number three where we take the size minus one start there and start at the end of the list go backwards until we get to zero, and zero is the last one we process. So that would be the way to remove from the list. Okay, these ones are going to cause some errors because they're removing things as we're going through, and it's going to affect the rest of the list. So you can say it's C. Okay, question 18. Okay, so we have find value, and we've got an array list of string elements and a string value as parameters, and returns true if the string value is found in the list and false otherwise. Okay, so here we have uh, our inputs. Okay, we have an array list of strings and a key. And we're looking for the key in the right 
in the array. So this is basically a search function. Go through the list. Okay, simple, go through the list. And let's see. If we thing equals key, return true. Else return uh, and then at the end, if we can't find if we haven't returned true by by here, then return false. Which of the following best explains the impact of the find value method when in line three int j equals zero is replaced by int j equals one? So what happens if we replace int j equals zero to int j equals one? Well, if that happens, we're going to start at one, and therefore the first we won't be checking against the first value in the list. Okay, so we're looking for uh, probably this answer. It will cause the method to return a different result when the key value is found only at the first index in the list. Okay. That brings us to the FRQ. All right, so this is where we get to do some code writing. All right, here we have a system to manage flights at an airport. Now, I want to before I talk about this, I want to talk about some general concepts for for these kind of questions. Okay, generally with FRQ questions, they will have a uh, and uh, two classes, right? Usually we get two classes. And then uh, one of the classes, uh, some kind of class, some kind of class with methods and like uh, usually like get methods. And then the other class, will have a list containing uh, objects of the first class. And generally your, your job is to make an object, put it in the list, or remove objects from the list, or some combination of both. And usually that's that's pretty common for these kind of questions. Uh, it's very, very common to have that kind of thing. So the more you do, the more you'll see that this is kind of normal. So let's read through. Here's our flight class. Um, return the number of passengers. So this is a get method. Uh, get price. Okay. So get the price of the seat on the flight. So we've got number of passengers, we've got the flight as a double, return as a double, we've got get capacity, so a maximum number of people, and other stuff. So that was pretty simple. We've just got a few get methods. Very, very simple. Okay, so the now here's our other class, airport. Contains a list, you guessed it, of flights. Right? And it's a private array list containing flights. So, again, we just this is what I said. Uh, we have one which is just a get set method, and then the other class list. Okay. So our job is to what are we going to do? Get total revenue. Um, so let's read part A. So first we're going to get total revenue, and then we're going to update by removing certain flights. Okay. So Basically, remove objects from the list. That's part B. Okay, so part A is going to require a calculation. I'm guessing. So let's see. Let's do the get total revenue first. Total revenue for all flights. Okay, revenue for the flight is the product of the number of passengers, so number of passengers, and the price of a seat. Okay, so. We need to do this for all flights into and out of the airport. So, 
we have a list of flights. We need to. Let's look at it. Go through the list. Get the revenue. Uh, get the what's it? The number of passengers. Get the price of a seat. Multiply the term. Seems like it, right? These are the co core components. It just so happens that this question is worth about, I think it's worth four points. And so you're going to get your four points that, this way. Um, first step, go through the list. All right. Well, go through the list. Um, can we go through here? Uh, this is just some examples. So if you're struggling with understanding it, the important thing is these are examples. These are specific values. We don't really need to worry about those. It's just to help you understand what's happening. So number of passengers, price of a seat. Okay, but there is a there is a complication to this question, and I did skip over it. So let's uh, just um, let's just clarify here. It's not as simple as just multiplying because. If there are more passengers on a flight than the flight has capacity for, the revenue for the flight is a product of the capacity and the price of a seat. So sometimes they, it's saying here that sometimes we have more passengers for a flight than are actually going to be on the flight. And we can't charge them, but they might be in the waiting list or something. So. If there's more passengers, we have to have the capacity as the maximum, right? This is what we're going to multiply. So there's kind of an if here. The if should give it away. Okay. So here is here is where we have to have an if. If more passengers capacity, then we're going to multiply. Uh, price by capacity and else we're going to be uh, multiply price by passengers something like this okay and then return the, the value okay so let's see how do we do this Let's use our array list to do this. Um, you know, these these kind of questions are. Uh, uh, this is an example too. So really, what we just have to use is the the values that we're given here. So put that in there. Okay. And this is a double, okay? So I'm going to return, I'm going to make it a double, total rev, and I'm going to return it. So at the end, happy ending. Okay, what happens in the middle is up to us. Okay, let's start out with total rev equals zero. It's a double. So, I mean, you can say 0, 0.0 or you can just say 0, it doesn't matter. So, basically what we've got here is a, uh, we need to go through the array. So, let's go back to what the array was, all flights. All right, so we're going to go through this list. Now, we have to go through the whole list. So, I would use an enhanced for loop. Let's go flight F, all flights. We can make it easy because we can just go through this whole list without any worries. Okay, so there, we're cycling through the whole list. Now, one thing that I suggest doing is when you start to get, you know, uh, quite complicated in your code, like you've got a few things that you're trying to do, you're trying to do some math, you're trying to grab some values. The biggest thing I would say is you need to simplify your code. Right? Don't be afraid to write more than one line. And so here what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab 
the essential information that I need. And for that, I'm going to go here and grab some info. Okay, so here's my flight. So I need to get the, the I want to I want to grab these values, get passengers, get the price, and get the capacity. I don't want to mess around doing all that stuff again and again. I'm just going to get the price of each flight, right? And the passengers and the capacity. So I want this information to, so that it's easy to deal with, right? And I think, um, let's see, passengers price. Okay, so I have to say um, price. And I'm going to have uh, passengers. I am price is a double, so this should be a double. Okay, double price. And I'm going to need int passengers. And I'm going to need um, capacity, which would be int as well. I'll just say cap easier. Okay, so how do I get these things? Okay, so, well, now, keep in mind, we're in the context of a loop, right? There are many flights. They're in a list. It's called all flights. I'm going through this list, right? Here's my list of flights, right? Flight one, flight two, flight three, etc. This is an object. Flight. The, we're looking at the flight class here. It has many parts. It has variables. It has methods. So I'm going to need to refer to these methods to get the information I need. So as I do my loop, each flight is called f. I'm going to refer to f and say, hey, f, let me access your methods. So for the price, I'm going to use get price. Now price is saved for this particular flight. Price is saved. Okay, let's do it for uh, get the passengers. I think it was just here. Oh, get num passages. And then capacity get dot get capacity. Okay, so now I've got my three variables, my three pieces of information that I need. No, this is going to get updated every single time you do the for loop. It's going to update these things. All right, so I'm happy with that. Okay, so now what I really need to do is to say, okay, how am I going to use this? I have an if statement here, right? Because we have a, a choice. If there's more pa uh, passengers than capacity, then I'm going to need to uh, do different calculations. So if pass greater than cap total rev. Now, notice that this is just one flight. Remember, I'm in a loop. This is just one flight I'm dealing with. So I need to add to my total revenue. I'm going to be adding up all the revenue from all the flights. So plus equals, and then I'm going to get the, uh, so capacity multiplied by price. And if it's if there's not, if there's less passengers than capacity, then I'm gonna to go total rev plus equals passengers multiplied by price. Now you see how when I do it this way, I don't have to worry about oh, putting all that capacity stuff here with f dot whatever. That would be a major uh, uh, paint if I had to do it that way okay 
If I used a regular for loop, I'd have to use also the get method as well, which I think also would be uh, a bit inconvenient. So it's kind of handy to do it this way. And I would suggest doing it that way. So at the end of this loop, I'm going to add it up all this total revenue, and then I can return it. Okay, so that's part A. Okay, so part B. Part B is asking us to remove update flights. Okay, so it's saying that, um, uh, let's see here. It removes from the array list all flights, any flight where the number of passengers is less than 20% of total capacity. The method should return the total number of passengers whose flight was removed. So we're going to be saving the values of the passengers. And we need to do a calculation about who to remove. All right, so uh, this is uh, public int update flights. And I don't think there's any inputs. And I'm returning the number of passengers, all right? So I'm actually got int num pass equals zero, start with zero. And at the end, I'm going to be returning num pass. How do I know it's an int here? Because I need to return the number of passengers, right? And the number of passengers is, is uh, an integer, right? All right, so it's less than 20% of the total capacity, not less than or equal to any flight where the number of passengers is less than 20% of total capacity. Okay, I'm removing stuff here from all flights. So what don't I use? I don't use an enhanced for loop and I don't use a for loop going up or going, you know, plus plus. I'm going to use the negative one. All right, so let's, let's take this. Uh, so let's go. Now I need to save my, uh, I'm comparing values again, right? So I'm comparing um, capacity and I'm comparing number of passengers, right? So I'm actually just, I'm going to grab these things here, capacity and number of passengers here. I'm copying that I'm putting that back in. Sorry, you can't do that when you write it in pen, but I'm copying that and putting that there just to make it speedier. However, I'm not in a for loop right now. And this code won't work in the context of what I'm doing. So actually I'm gonna to have to modify these values. I need them inside my loop, um, but first I have to do a loop and I have to do a different kind of loop. So um, maybe the copy paste wouldn't really help that much. So here we go, I'm gonna go through my flights, okay? So let's start with um, int and let's say uh, now this is going to be the index value right so int i equals uh, all flights dot size minus one so I'm starting at the end right i greater than or equal to zero and i minus minus. This is how we get a loop, which is a going backwards. Okay, so now my pass and my, my capacity uh, will not be as useful. Um, so what we actually need to do here is to uh, make them a little bit more useful. Let's go f dot get i there we go add that get i and we're no longer talking about f because f is no longer relevant we're talking about all flights all flights dot get all flights so we're using the array get and then we're using the flight Okay, so now we've got the info we need. Saved in the pass, saved in the cap. Now we need our formula. If. Okay, so it was the 
if the if the passengers are less than capacity, right? So if passengers less than capacity multiplied by zero point two, twenty percent of capacity. then we should remove them from the list, but we also have to add them to the number of passengers. Right? So number of passengers plus equals pass. And then we're going to all flights remove I. So we've removed it from the list. We're saving the information removing the thing from the list and uh, that should do it okay so again I, I definitely suggest that you do uh, this kind of thing in fact it's probably better to when you're doing this um, when we say pass I'm going to say pass up there and it would be better actually to declare it outside the for loop. I prefer that. Uh, it may work within the for loop as a local variable, but I just prefer to do up here in cap, right? Because um, sometimes, you know, it's not convenient to, sometimes you want to hang on to these values afterwards. So just as a habit, uh, after the for loop, they'll get destroyed, right? So in case you ever want to take one of these values and use it later, uh, it's just a good habit to be declaring them up there. So anyway, uh, here we have uh, the final code. So that's the answer for that one. All right, the next one, part C. The program would like to add a method called get most luggage capacity. Okay, so luggage by weight. Okay, well, so the flight has capacity, luggage capacity. So it's saying you have to write a description. Now this is one of those parts where you're just doing a descri description. So you're writing some text. It says, make sure to include the method header. Okay, so this is, let's see, method header. Returns a flight object called get most luggage capacity. So that's easy. Okay, so the method header would be public, and we're returning a flight object, flight, get most luggage capacity. Right. Now, what would I have to do to make this work? Well, I would need to, um, this, obviously the luggage capacity is a property of a flight, how much luggage capacity a flight has. So I would need to double instance variable uh, for luggage capacity. That's what I need to do. Um, I would probably also need to uh, identify any new modified variables, constructors, or methods. So yeah, I'd, I'd probably need to, hmm, I would need to add or modify the constructor to allow for the capacity uh, the luggage luggage capacity to be added. Uh, I would need need a get method to return the uh, value of the luggage capacity, right? And I would say this would be, be better to say private there because it should be a private double instance variable. Okay. 
and then I would need to update the airport. So it's now the airport, uh, the airport would have a uh, method. So I would add the method uh, get most luggage capacity to the airport class. So it's just things like that, like just adding things to which place you can add them to and uh, that'd be enough I think. You don't need to write the program code so if you do that you're on the wrong, wrong uh, direction. Okay, so I hope that's been a bit of help. Uh, hopefully my answers were mostly correct. I think pretty much correct. I think I did get some, some wrong, but um, yeah. If you have time, go back and read the questions. Otherwise, yeah, best of luck.